It was a typical Tuesday morning when Congressman Julian Thompson left his suburban home, ready for another busy day of meetings and community events. As one of the few black congressmen in his state, Julian carried the weight of responsibility on his shoulders wherever he went. He'd always made a point to stay close to the people he represented, driving himself in his modest but sleek black sedan, a car that symbolized the balance between his success and his grounded roots. Julian's morning routine was straightforward. Breakfast with his wife, Sonia, a brief chat with his two teenage sons about school, and then a drive into the city. Today, he had an important meeting downtown about a community development project, one that he had been passionately advocating for, aimed at revitalizing struggling neighborhoods. As he backed out of his driveway, he took a deep breath, already focused on the challenges of the day ahead. The drive was peaceful at first, the kind of morning that allowed Julian to reflect on his career and how far he'd come. He often thought about his upbringing, growing up in a working-class neighborhood, the son of a bus driver and a school teacher. His parents had instilled in him a deep sense of duty to serve others, which had led him into politics. And now as a congressman, Julian felt that every mile he drove was a reminder of the road he had traveled to get here. The city skyline came into view as Julian merged onto the highway. His thoughts wandered to the development meeting, the conversations he needed to have, and the plans he hoped to set in motion. But just as he was getting comfortable, he noticed a police cruiser behind him. The lights were off, but it followed him closely. Julian's calm demeanor shifted as a twinge of anxiety took hold. He'd been pulled over before. Every black man of his generation had stories. But this felt different. Julian remained composed as the cruiser's lights suddenly flicked on and a siren wailed. It was clear now. He was being pulled over. Confusion filled his mind. He hadn't been speeding, nor had he violated any traffic laws. What was going on? Julian signaled and pulled to the side of the road, his heart beating a little faster. He kept his hands visible on the wheel, rehearsing the standard routine in his head. Remain calm, be respectful, follow the officer's instructions. He knew all too well how these situations could escalate, and he was determined not to let this encounter go sideways. But still, a question lingered. Why had he been stopped? A white officer in his mid-thirties stepped out of the police cruiser and approached Julian's car. He wore a stern expression, one that suggested suspicion rather than concern. As he reached the driver's side window, Julian lowered it, forcing a polite smile onto his face. Good morning, officer. Is there a problem? He asked, keeping his voice steady and composed. The officer didn't return the greeting. Instead, his eyes darted around the interior of the car before locking on to Julian's face. License and registration, the officer barked, his tone clipped and direct. Julian handed over the requested documents without hesitation, trying not to let the officer's demeanor rattle him. But there was something in the officer's eyes, an edge, a suspicion that felt unwarranted. The officer flipped through the documents quickly, then glanced back at Julian. Where are you headed, he asked, still peering suspiciously into the car. Julian chose his words carefully. I'm on my way to a meeting downtown, he said, his voice remaining calm. I'm Congressman Julian Thompson. Is there an issue? The officer didn't acknowledge Julian's introduction. Instead, he asked another question. Is this your car? His tone suggested doubt, as if Julian didn't fit his expectation of someone who could own a car like this. Julian felt a familiar frustration rise within him, but he pushed it down. Yes, officer, it's my car. Is there a reason you pulled me over? And the officer's eyes narrowed as he looked back down at Julian's license. It was clear he hadn't registered Julian's introduction, or worse, he didn't care. Step out of the vehicle, the officer ordered, taking a step back and placing his hand near his holster. Julian's breath caught in his throat. This was escalating quickly and it was clear that the officer was acting on assumptions rather than facts. Julian knew that stepping out of the car could be a dangerous move, but refusing to comply would only make things worse. He nodded slowly, making his movements deliberate. I'm getting out, he said clearly, hoping his words would keep the officer calm. He opened the door and stepped onto the shoulder of the highway, feeling the cold morning air against his face. The officer took a step back, eyeing Julian up and down. Face the car and put your hands on the hood, he commanded. Julian's face tightened, but he complied. 
He placed his hands on the hood of his own car, feeling the metal cold beneath his palms. This was a reality he knew too well, the sense of being stripped of dignity, treated as a suspect without cause. A second police car pulled up, its lights flashing as it parked behind the first. Another officer, a younger white man, stepped out and approached quickly, surveying the scene. What's going on here? The second officer asked, his voice carrying over the sound of passing traffic. Julian remained silent, his hands still on the hood of the car, as the first officer explained. Pulled him over for suspicious activity, the first officer replied. Claims he's a congressman, but I'm not buying it. The second officer glanced at Julian, his face showing a hint of skepticism. Julian wanted to shout, to demand that they look up his name, to tell them how absurd this all was. But he stayed quiet, knowing that speaking out could make things worse. As Julian stood there, his hands pressed firmly against the hood of his car, he could feel the anger simmering beneath the surface. The officer's treatment was a stark reminder of the reality that so many black men faced, being seen not for who they were, but for the assumptions cast upon them. And despite his status as a congressman, he was experiencing firsthand the same biases he had fought against his entire life. The second officer, sensing that the situation needed further investigation, took Julian's license and walked back to his cruiser. Julian stood in silence, feeling the eyes of the first officer on him. The minutes stretched on, and he couldn't help but wonder what would happen next. Would they verify his identity and apologize? Or would this confrontation escalate into something more dangerous? Inside the second police cruiser, the younger officer ran Julian's information through their database. As he read the results, his eyes widened in surprise. Hey, this guy's legit, he called out to his partner. He's a congressman. The first officer's expression faltered for the first time, a mix of surprise and embarrassment flashing across his face. He glanced at Julian, as if seeing him for the first time. The younger officer quickly exited the cruiser and walked over to Julian. His demeanor changed. I'm sorry, sir, he said, handing back Julian's license. We, uh, didn't realize who you were. Julian straightened up slowly, his anger barely contained. And why should that matter? he asked, his voice low and steady. Whether I'm a congressman or not, I should be treated with respect. The first officer, who had remained silent throughout the exchange, finally spoke up. It's just protocol, he muttered defensively. We're just doing our job. Julian locked eyes with him, the weight of his frustration clear. Then maybe it's time to change how you do your job, he said, his voice carrying a sharp edge. Julian took his license and registration back but the damage had been done. He stood on the side of the road looking at the officers who had treated him like a criminal moments before. The realization that his status as a congressman was the only thing that had prevented this situation from escalating further left him with a bitter taste. It was a stark reminder that no amount of success or respectability could shield him from the prejudices that black people faced every day. The officers retreated to their cruisers, their demeanor now sheepish and subdued. Julian got back into his car, closing the door with a quiet click, and sat for a moment, staring out at the road ahead. He could feel his pulse pounding in his temples, and he took a few deep breaths to steady himself. He was angry, but more than that, he was resolute. This was why he had entered politics in the first place, to fight these very injustices. As he pulled back onto the highway, Julian couldn't help but think about the irony of it all. Here he was on his way to a meeting to discuss community development and law enforcement accountability, only to be confronted by the very issues he sought to resolve. The incident replayed in his mind, the suspicion in the officer's eyes, the way they had immediately assumed the worst. It was a reminder that the work he was doing was far from over. Driving into the city, Julian thought about the faces of his constituents, the people who had put their faith in him to bring about change. He had promised them better policies, better protections. And now more than ever, he felt the urgency of that promise. He knew that if anything was going to change, it had to start with the law, with reforming the system that allowed this kind of behavior to go unchecked. By the time he reached his destination, Julian's resolve had only strengthened. Today had been a wake-up call, a stark reminder that there was still so much to do.
and as he prepared to face the challenges of his meeting, one thought echoed in his mind. The fight for justice was far from over. When Julian arrived at the government office downtown, his mind was still racing from the traffic stop. But he couldn't afford to let his personal anger cloud the day's agenda. He was here for a crucial meeting with city officials, developers, and community leaders to discuss the development project that had become the cornerstone of his term. He stepped out of his car, smoothed down his suit, and straightened his tie, forcing himself to focus. As he walked through the building's lobby, his assistant Mara hurried to meet him, concern written all over her face. Congressman, are you all right? She asked in a hushed voice, leaning in as they walked toward the elevators. Julian gave a brief nod, not wanting to get into the details yet. I'm fine, he said, trying to keep his tone even. Let's just focus on the meeting. The conference room buzzed with anticipation. The development project was controversial, with different factions pushing for various interests. Affordable housing advocates, business owners wanting commercial space, and police representatives concerned about public safety. Julian knew it was his role to bring these parties together to ensure that whatever decisions were made, they would benefit the community as a whole. As he took his seat at the head of the long, polished table, the room quieted, faces turned toward him, waiting for him to speak. Julian cleared his throat, his eyes sweeping over the crowd. He could see the skepticism in some, the hope in others, but all he could think about was the encounter with the police earlier that morning. It was a reminder of why he fought for these initiatives, why he needed to make sure every policy he passed created a safer, more just community for all. Thank you all for being here, Julian began, his voice calm but carrying a new edge of determination. We have an opportunity today to make real change, to uplift our neighborhoods, and to create a future that we can all be proud of. But to do that, we need to work together. We need to listen to each other's perspectives, and we need to remember that we're all here for one reason, to make our city a better place. And then Throughout the meeting, Julian found himself carrying the weight of the morning's encounter. Discussions went back and forth about zoning laws, economic development, and public safety. The police representatives expressed concerns over how the project might affect their ability to patrol effectively, while community leaders stressed the importance of affordable housing and social programs. Julian listened intently, nodding as each person spoke, but his thoughts were never far from the traffic stop. At one point, a developer proposed increasing police presence in the new neighborhood to deter crime. The suggestion sparked a heated debate, with some members of the meeting supporting the idea and others vehemently opposing it, arguing that more police would lead to racial profiling and tension within the community. Julian's eyes flickered as he listened. He knew how easily the balance between safety and over-policing could be tipped. Congressman Thompson, one of the developers said, snapping Julian back to the present. What are your thoughts on the matter? Do you think an increased police presence would benefit the project? All eyes were on him, waiting for his response. Julian paused, his mind racing through the morning's events, trying to find the right words to bridge the divide between safety and justice. I think we need to be careful about how we approach this, Julian said carefully. I believe in public safety, but I also believe that our approach needs to be balanced. It's not just about having more officers on the streets. It's about having officers who understand the community they're serving, who are trained in de-escalation, and who are held accountable for their actions. There were nods of agreement from some in the room and murmurs of discontent from others. Julian continued, Our goal here is to build a community where everyone feels safe, both from crime and from unfair treatment. That means working with the police, yes, but also ensuring that their presence is positive and constructive. He knew it wasn't an easy answer, but it was the truth and the only path forward he could stand behind. After the meeting adjourned, Julian's assistant Mara approached him with a mix of concern and curiosity. Congressman, are you sure you're okay? She asked, lowering her voice as they walked down the hallway. You seem distracted today, and I noticed you were a little late this morning, which is unusual for you. Julian sighed, realizing that he couldn't keep the incident to himself any longer. I was pulled over this morning, he admitted, stopping by the window that overlooked the city streets. A routine traffic stop, or so they said. 
but it quickly turned into something else, a situation where my identity as a black man was questioned before anything else. It wasn't until they realized I was a congressman that they let me go. He could feel the anger rising as he spoke, but he forced himself to remain composed. Mara's eyes widened in shock. That's unbelievable, she whispered, shaking her head. After everything you've done, everything you stand for, they still... How could they treat you like that? Julian nodded, appreciating her outrage. It's not about me, Mara, he said quietly. It's about a system that sees blackness as a threat before it sees anything else. And it's a reminder that no matter how much progress we make, we have a long way to go. Mara nodded, clearly shaken. So what are you going to do? She asked, her voice filled with a sense of urgency. You have a platform. People will listen to you. You can't let this slide. Julian thought for a moment, considering his options. He knew that going public with the story would make waves, but it would also be a chance to shine a light on the very issues he was fighting to change. I'm going to speak out, he said finally, his voice filled with determination. If this can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. And if my story can help push for the reforms we need, then that's what I'll do. That night, as Julian sat at home with his family, he couldn't shake the feeling that something had to be done. The incident had left a bitter taste in his mouth, but more than that, it had reignited his drive to fight for justice. As his wife, Sonia, prepared dinner in the kitchen and his sons did their homework at the dining table, Julian felt the weight of responsibility settle over him. He needed to speak out, not just for himself, but for everyone who faced discrimination every day. After dinner, Julian sat down with Sonia in their living room, the city lights glowing softly through the windows. I need to talk to you about something, he began, his voice serious. Sonia set down her book and turned to him, her eyes filled with understanding. She knew when he had something heavy on his mind, and tonight was one of those nights. Julian recounted the events of the morning, from the traffic stop to the officer's questioning, to the moment they realized who he was. Sonia listened in silence, her face hardening with anger as he spoke. I can't believe this she said finally, her voice trembling with emotion. They treated you like a criminal just because of the way you look, and they wouldn't have even let you go if they didn't know who you were. Julian nodded, feeling the frustration bubbling up once again. I know, and that's why I need to speak out. I can't just let this go. People need to know that this is happening, even to someone like me. If I don't say something, then I'm letting it happen to everyone else who doesn't have the same platform. Sonia reached out and took his hand, her expression softening. Then speak out, she said firmly. Tell your story. People will listen. And if it makes even one person think twice about their biases, then it's worth it. Julian felt a wave of gratitude wash over him. Sonia had always been his rock, and her support gave him the strength to move forward. He knew that going public wouldn't be easy, but it was the right thing to do. The next morning, Julian called his communications director and scheduled a press conference. He knew that sharing his story would be controversial. Some would support him, while others would accuse him of stirring up trouble. But he also knew that silence wasn't an option. The issue was too important, too urgent to be ignored. He spent the morning preparing his statement, making sure every word carried the weight of his experience. When the time came, Julian stood behind the podium at the local press room cameras flashing and reporters crowded in tight. He took a deep breath, looking out over the sea of faces. He wasn't just speaking as a congressman, he was speaking as a black man, a father and a member of the community he served. The gravity of the moment pressed down on him, but he remained resolute. Yesterday morning, I was pulled over by the police, Julian began, his voice calm but powerful. A routine stop, they called it, but I was questioned, treated like a suspect, and only when they learned I was a congressman did the situation change. This isn't about me. This is about the countless people who face this kind of treatment every day, without any protection, without any recourse. He paused, letting his words sink in. We need to address the biases that exist within our law enforcement. We need transparency, accountability, and a commitment to serving every member of our community equally. I stand here today not just as a congressman, but as someone who believes in justice for all. And I won't stop fighting until we achieve it. The room erupted in questions, cameras flashing as journalists shouted for his attention. 
but Julian felt a sense of calm wash over him. He had spoken his truth, and now it was time to let the world respond. Julian's press conference sent shockwaves through the media. Within hours, clips of his speech were circulating on social media, and the hashtag Jabberge Justice for Julian began trending. Support poured in from across the political spectrum. Community leaders, civil rights activists, and fellow politicians all voiced their solidarity with his message. But as the story spread, so did the scrutiny. Some questioned the validity of his claims, while others praised his courage in speaking out. The reactions were polarizing, with some praising Julian as a champion for justice, and others accusing him of politicizing an isolated incident. Conservative news outlets downplayed the traffic stop, suggesting that it was an overreaction to a routine procedure, while progressive voices rallied behind Julian's call for reform. The debate spilled over into national conversations about policing, racial profiling, and the struggles faced by black men in America. Julian's phone buzzed constantly with messages and calls. There were words of encouragement from old friends, thanks from people who had experienced similar stops, and even a message from a young man who said he felt seen for the first time. But the vitriol was just as strong. Racist messages, threats, and accusations of race-baiting filled his inbox. It was overwhelming at times, but Julian knew that this was the price of change. At home, Julian's family rallied around him. Sonia kept a close watch on the news, defending her husband's stance to anyone who would listen. Layla, his teenage daughter, spoke up in school discussions, educating her classmates about the challenges of systemic racism. Even his youngest son, Jason, proudly told his friends that his dad was fighting for what's right. Their support was Julian's anchor, keeping him grounded in the midst of the storm. In the days that followed, Julian's office fielded calls from organizations wanting to partner with him on police reform efforts. He had sparked a conversation that was long overdue, and now it was time to turn that conversation into action. Julian felt the burden of responsibility, but also a renewed sense of purpose. The world was listening, and he was ready to speak louder than ever. While many in Julian's district supported his stance, there were those who felt differently. Some members of the local police department were outraged by his comments, feeling that he had unfairly criticized their profession. Police unions issued statements defending their officers, arguing that traffic stops were an essential tool for public safety and that incidents like Julian's were being blown out of proportion. In the midst of this, a meeting was called between Julian and the local police department. The police chief, a veteran officer who had served the community for decades, wanted to discuss the implications of Julian's public statement and address the rising tensions. Julian knew this meeting would be a delicate balancing act. He needed to express the need for change while also acknowledging the vital role that law enforcement played. When Julian arrived at the police station, he was met with cool stares and tense silence. Officers stood in the halls, their arms crossed and their eyes hard as he walked past. It was clear that some of them saw him as an adversary, not an ally. But Julian had come to build bridges, not burn them. He took a deep breath and reminded himself of his goal, to foster understanding and push for reform that would benefit everyone. The meeting took place in a large conference room where Julian sat across from the police chief and several senior officers. The chief, a middle-aged white man with a stern expression, began by outlining the department's stance. Congressman Thompson, we respect your position and the work you do, he said, but we also have to protect our officers and their right to do their job. Traffic stops are an important part of keeping our streets safe. Julian listened carefully before responding. I understand that, Chief, he replied, his voice steady. But what I experienced wasn't just about a traffic stop. It was about the assumptions made before any questions were asked. It was about a system that's too quick to judge based on appearance. I'm not saying all officers are guilty of this, but we need to address the reality of these biases. That's the only way we can build trust between the community and law enforcement. The conversation in the police station conference room was difficult but necessary. Julian and the officers debated the nuances of policing, the challenges faced on the streets, and the mistrust that had built up between the community and law enforcement. There were moments of tension, times when voices rose and tempers flared, but there were also moments of understanding where both sides found common ground. 
Julian emphasized the importance of training officers on cultural sensitivity, de-escalation tactics, and implicit bias. This isn't about attacking the police, he said. This is about making sure every interaction you have is one that builds trust and respect. It's about making sure that every citizen feels safe, no matter what they look like or where they come from. One of the officers, a young Latino man who had grown up in the same district Julian represented, spoke up. I get where you're coming from, Congressman, he said, his tone sincere. I've seen some things out there that don't sit right with me either, and I want to do better. I want all of us to do better. But we need support too. We need to know that if we make a mistake, we won't be thrown under the bus. It's a tough job. Julian nodded, appreciating the candor. I hear you, he said, and I want to make sure that good officers are supported. But that also means holding everyone accountable when they step out of line. If we can agree on that, then we can start to rebuild the trust that's been broken. By the end of the meeting, there was no perfect solution, no magic fix to years of mistrust and tension. But there was progress. Julian and the police chief agreed to work together on a new community engagement initiative, one that would bring officers and residents together to discuss their concerns, build relationships, and find ways to improve safety and trust. It was a small step, but a step in the right direction. In the weeks that followed, Julian's story continued to resonate across the nation. He was invited to speak at conferences, community events, and college campuses, sharing his experience in advocating for police reform. The more he spoke, the more he realized that his story wasn't unique. It was part of a larger tapestry of experiences shared by Black Americans across the country. At a town hall event, Julian stood before a packed auditorium, his voice echoing off the walls as he spoke about the importance of police accountability. This isn't about choosing sides, he said, looking out over the diverse crowd. This is about making sure that our systems serve everyone fairly and that our communities can trust those who are sworn to protect them. If we want real change, we have to come together and demand it. The audience erupted into applause and Julian felt a sense of hope wash over him. It wasn't easy being in the spotlight, and there were days when the criticism and negativity threatened to overwhelm him. But moments like this, where he could see the impact of his words, gave him the strength to keep going. He was fighting for something bigger than himself, and the movement was growing. Julian also began meeting with lawmakers at the state and federal levels, pushing for legislation that would require body cameras for officers, establish independent review boards for police misconduct, and mandate de-escalation training. Some lawmakers were resistant, viewing the reforms as an attack on law enforcement, but others saw the necessity of change and joined Julian in drafting proposals that would bring about meaningful reform. Meanwhile, his work with the local police department continued. Officers attended community meetings, listened to resident stories, and participated in training sessions designed to improve their interactions with the public. It wasn't perfect. There were still challenges and setbacks, but the effort to rebuild trust was genuine, and it was making a difference. As Julian's public profile grew, so did the pressure on his family. Sonia was constantly fielding questions from friends and neighbors, and the kids were dealing with attention at school, both supportive and critical. One day, Layla came home visibly upset, her backpack slung over one shoulder as she stormed into the living room. Julian immediately knew something was wrong. What happened, Layla? He asked gently setting down the newspaper he had been reading. Layla's face was flushed with frustration as she threw her backpack onto the couch. Some kids at school were saying you're just doing this for attention, she said, her voice breaking. They said you're making a big deal out of nothing, that you're trying to make the police look bad. Julian felt a pang in his chest, but he forced himself to stay calm. I'm sorry you had to hear that, he said, reaching out to pull Layla into a hug. But you have to remember... There are always going to be people who don't understand what we're fighting for. They haven't lived our experience, and they haven't seen the things we've seen. But that doesn't mean we're wrong to speak up. Layla sniffled, burying her face in his shoulder. I just don't like it when people talk about you like that, she mumbled. You're doing the right thing, and they don't get it. Julian held her tight, feeling a mix of pride and sadness. It wasn't fair that his children had to deal with the backlash of his work but he also knew that this was part of what it meant to fight for justice. You're strong, Layla, Julian said softly. 
and I'm proud of you for standing up for what's right. Not everyone will understand, but that's okay. We just have to keep doing what we know is right, and one day things will be better for all of us. With Julian's visibility came not only support, but also backlash. Anonymous emails, social media posts, and even letters sent to his office contained hateful messages and threats. Some warned him to stay in his lane, while others were more aggressive, accusing him of trying to undermine law enforcement and inciting racial tension. Julian knew that his message was powerful enough to inspire both hope and fear. Fear from those who resisted change. One night, as Julian sat at his desk reviewing policy proposals, Sonia entered the room holding a letter in her hand. Her face was pale, and she looked deeply concerned. Julian, I think you should see this, she said, handing him the crumpled piece of paper. It was a handwritten note filled with vile, racist language and a threat to harm him and his family if he didn't stop talking. Julian's chest tightened as he read the words. He had expected criticism, even anger, but the direct threat against his family was a different matter. He set the letter down slowly, trying to keep his voice steady. We need to be careful, he said quietly, looking into Sonia's eyes. I'll talk to the security team and make sure we're protected, but I can't stop what I'm doing. That's exactly what they want. Sonia nodded, her expression a mix of fear and determination. I know you won't stop, she said, her voice soft but resolute. And I wouldn't want you to. But just promise me you'll be careful. Promise me you'll protect yourself. Julian squeezed her hand, feeling the weight of the promise he was making. I promise, he said. We'll get through this. Together. The next day, Julian's office took steps to increase security, and he addressed the threats publicly. There are those who will try to intimidate us into silence he said in a press statement, but I will not be silenced. The fight for justice and equality is too important to back down now. We will continue this work, no matter the obstacles. As the debate over police reform continued, tensions rose within the city. Protests became a common sight, with demonstrators gathering outside government buildings, police stations, and city hall. The crowds were diverse, young and old, black and white, all united in their call for change. But the protests also drew counter-demonstrators, people who believed that the push for police reform was an attack on law enforcement itself. Julian attended many of the peaceful protests, speaking to the crowds about the need for accountability and understanding. He saw the passion in their eyes, heard the urgency in their chants, and felt their hope for a better future. We're not here to tear anyone down, he would say, standing on a platform with a megaphone in hand. We're here to lift everyone up to create a system that works for all of us, that protects all of us. But there were moments when the tension spilled over. One afternoon, as Julian marched with a group of protesters through the downtown area, a confrontation broke out between a group of demonstrators and some counter-protesters. The shouting quickly escalated, and Julian found himself caught between the two sides, trying to de-escalate the situation. Please, let's not turn to violence, he urged, holding his hands up in a gesture of peace. We have to find a way to talk to each other. The police quickly intervened, separating the groups and dispersing the crowd. But the incident left a lasting mark on the city, a reminder of how deeply divided people were on the issue of policing and race. Julian knew that healing those divisions would take time and patience, but he was more determined than ever to keep pushing for dialogue and understanding. That evening, he returned home feeling the exhaustion of the day's events. Sonia embraced him as soon as he walked through the door, and for a moment they stood in silence, holding each other close. It's getting harder, isn't it? She whispered. Julian nodded, resting his head on her shoulder. Yeah, he admitted, but I won't stop. We're making progress, even if it's slow. Despite the growing tensions, there were also moments of hope and solidarity that took Julian by surprise. One day he received a call from a prominent business leader, an older white man who had previously spoken out against the police reforms. The man's voice was different this time, softer, more reflective. Congressman Thompson, he began, I wanted to reach out because, well, I've been thinking a lot about what you've said, and I'd like to talk. Julian was intrigued and agreed to meet. They arranged to have coffee at a local cafe, and as they sat across from each other, the businessman, Mr. Cole, began to explain his change of heart. 
I'll be honest, um, I didn't get it at first, Cole admitted. I thought all this talk about police reform was just political, but I started listening to the stories. People I know, people who've been through what you described, and it opened my eyes. Julian listened intently, nodding as Cole spoke. He could sense the sincerity in the man's voice, the genuine desire to understand and make things right. I want to help, Cole said finally, leaning forward. I don't know exactly how, but if there's anything I can do to support this movement, to support what you're doing, I'm in. Julian felt a sense of hope that he hadn't felt in weeks. He knew that changing minds and hearts was a slow process, but this was proof that it was possible. Thank you, Mr. Cole, Julian said warmly. Your support means more than you know. And I think there are many ways you can help, starting with sharing your story. People listen to you, and if they hear that you've changed your perspective, it might help them change theirs. The two men left the cafe with a new sense of partnership, and over the following weeks, Mr. Cole became a vocal supporter of Julian's efforts. He used his platform to speak about the importance of police reform and racial justice, helping to bridge the gap between communities that had long been divided. Mm -hmm. While the work in the community was making a difference, Julian knew that real systemic change required legislation. He had been working tirelessly with his team to draft a comprehensive police reform bill, one that would address the key issues of accountability, training, and community engagement. But getting the bill through the state legislature was a battle in itself. The bill faced fierce opposition from some lawmakers, particularly those who had strong ties to law enforcement. They argued that the proposed reforms would tie the hands of police officers and make it more difficult to enforce the law. Julian knew that winning them over would be difficult, but he was committed to finding a way to move the bill forward. Day after day, Julian and his team met with lawmakers from both sides of the aisle, explaining the details of the bill and the urgency of its passage. He shared not only his personal story, but also the stories of countless others who had experienced racial profiling and police brutality. He presented data on how reform could improve public safety and strengthen community trust. Slowly, he began to sway some of the skeptics. One evening, as the bill was being debated on the floor of the state legislature, Julian stood up to make his final plea. This isn't about being anti-police, he said, his voice echoing through the chamber. This is about being pro-community, pro-justice. It's about making sure that our officers have the tools they need to do their jobs effectively, while ensuring that every citizen is treated with dignity and respect. This bill is about accountability, transparency, and fairness, and it's time we made it law. There was a tense silence as the lawmakers prepared to vote. Julian held his breath, knowing that the outcome could change everything. The votes were cast and Julian's heart pounded as the final count was read aloud. The police reform bill had passed, by a narrow margin, but a victory nonetheless. The chamber erupted into applause, with supporters cheering and shaking Julian's hand. It was a moment of triumph, a culmination of months of hard work, dedication, and resilience. Julian felt a wave of relief and pride wash over him as he realized that this was a turning point, not just for his community, but for the state as a whole. Julian's team celebrated late into the night, toasting to the success and reflecting on the journey that had brought them here. This is just the beginning, Julian said, raising his glass. We have a lot more work to do, but today we made history, and we showed that when people come together, when they listen, understand, and fight for what's right, change is possible. You know, the passing of the bill made headlines across the state and beyond. News outlets hailed it as a landmark achievement in the fight for racial justice and police accountability. Community leaders praised Julian's courage and leadership, and messages of congratulations poured in from across the country. For a moment, it felt like the tide was finally turning. But Julian knew that this victory was just one battle won. The implementation of the reforms would be the real test, and he was prepared to hold the state accountable to ensure that the changes were more than just words on paper. The fight for justice was far from over, but with each step forward, Julian felt a renewed sense of hope. Passing the police reform bill was a victory, but Julian soon realized that implementing the changes would be an entirely different battle. While the new law set clear standards for training, accountability, and oversight, actually putting those measures into practice required cooperation from law enforcement agencies, 
local governments, and communities, all with different levels of readiness and resistance. Now, one of the biggest challenges was getting police departments to buy into the new reforms. Some officers welcomed the changes, believing that increased transparency and better training would help rebuild trust with the communities they served. But others, particularly those in leadership positions, saw the reforms as an attack on their authority and traditions. The pushback was loud and, at times, aggressive. Police unions were vocal in their opposition, holding press conferences and lobbying local leaders to resist the changes. Julian spent his days traveling from city to city, meeting with police chiefs, mayors, and community leaders to explain the benefits of the reforms and address their concerns. At each stop, he encountered different levels of skepticism and support. Some cities embraced the changes wholeheartedly, rolling out new training programs and establishing independent oversight boards. Others dragged their feet, looking for loopholes to avoid full compliance with the new law. One afternoon, Julian found himself sitting across from a police chief who had openly criticized the reform bill. The chief, a grizzled veteran with decades of experience, leaned back in his chair, arms crossed. Congressman, I've been doing this job for over 30 years, he said, his voice steady but firm, and I don't need a politician telling me how to run my department. These reforms, they're not practical. They're going to make it harder for us to do our jobs. Julian nodded, choosing his words carefully. Chief, I understand your concern, he replied, but these reforms aren't about making your job harder. They're about making it safer for your officers and for the people they serve. We need to build trust, and that starts with accountability and understanding. I'm not asking you to change overnight, but I am asking you to give this a chance. The chief sighed, leaning forward with a thoughtful expression. I don't like it, he admitted, but I respect what you're trying to do, and I respect the fact that you he had face to face. It was a small concession, but one that gave Julian hope that even among the most resistant, there was room for change. While working with law enforcement was a challenge, Julian found that the community was more than ready to embrace the reforms. He held town hall meetings, community forums, and neighborhood events to discuss the new law and its impact. At every event, he was met with an outpouring of stories, stories of mistrust, of fear, of hope. People who had felt voiceless for so long were finally being heard. One of the most powerful moments came during a community forum in a predominantly black neighborhood. An elderly woman stood up, her voice shaking as she spoke. Congressman Thompson, I've lived in this neighborhood my whole life, she said, and I've seen things change for the better and for the worse. But I've always felt like we've been forgotten, like our voices didn't matter. But what you're doing, it gives me hope. For my kids, for my grandkids, thank you. The room erupted in applause and Julian felt tears prick the corners of his eyes. It was moments like this that reminded him why he was fighting so hard. Why every meeting, every argument, every late night was worth it. The community was ready to heal and he was determined to be there to help guide them through it. Julian's team also partnered with local organizations to offer educational sessions on citizens' rights, de-escalation techniques, and community police relationship building. The goal was to empower residents with knowledge and create spaces where police and citizens could come together as equals. At one of these events, a young black man and a police officer sat down together to share their experiences, each expressing their fears, assumptions, and hopes for the future. By the end of the conversation, they shook hands, both visibly moved by the exchange. It was a reminder that, despite the challenges, there was a path forward, and that path was built on understanding, empathy, and the willingness to see each other as human. As the reforms began to take hold in his state, Julian's work gained national attention. News outlets across the country covered the story of the congressman who had turned a traffic stop into a movement for change. His story was featured on talk shows, in national newspapers, and on online platforms making Julian a symbol of the fight for justice and accountability. One day, Julian received a call from a well-known political commentator inviting him to speak on a nationally televised town hall about racial justice and police reform. The opportunity was huge. It would put Julian's message in front of millions of viewers and amplify the call for change far beyond his state. Julian agreed, feeling a mix of excitement and nervousness as the date approached. 
The town hall was held in a large auditorium filled with a diverse audience eager to hear from Julian and the other panelists, civil rights activists, law enforcement officials, and community leaders. As he sat on stage under the bright lights, Julian felt the weight of the moment. This was his chance to not just share his story, but to speak on behalf of everyone who had faced injustice and been silenced. Congressman Thompson, the moderator began, you've been at the forefront of police reform in your state. What do you believe is the key to bridging the divide between law enforcement and communities of color? Julian took a deep breath, choosing his words carefully. The key is empathy, he said, looking out at the audience. We need to see each other as human beings first. We need to listen to each other's stories, understand each other's fears, and find ways to build trust. This isn't just about changing laws, it's about changing hearts and minds. And that starts with honest conversations and the willingness to work together toward a better future. The applause that followed was thunderous and Julian felt a surge of hope. This was bigger than just one state, one reform bill. This was a movement that was spreading across the country and he was proud to be part of it. Despite the national support, not everyone was on board with the reforms, and some of the pushback came from within Julian's own party. There were lawmakers who privately questioned his approach, worried that he was alienating potential allies by pushing too hard, too fast. Some were concerned that the reforms could hurt relationships with police unions, while others worried about losing votes in their districts. One day, Julian was approached by a senior member of his party, an older black congressman who had been in politics for decades. Julian, I respect what you're trying to do, the man said as they walked down the halls of the state capitol. But you need to be careful. These reforms are good in theory, but if you push too hard, you risk losing support from some of the people we need to keep our seats. And that means losing the ability to make any change at all. Julian stopped turning to face his colleague. I understand what you're saying, he replied, trying to keep his tone respectful. But if we don't push for real change now, when will we? If we're always worried about votes and support, then nothing will ever get better. And I can't stand by and let that happen. The older congressman sighed, shaking his head. I know you mean well, Julian, and I hope you're right. But just remember, politics is a long game, and sometimes change takes longer than we want it to. With that, he walked away, leaving Julian standing alone in the hallway, wrestling with his own doubts. Julian knew that he had to find a balance between urgency and pragmatism, but he also knew that the time for half measures had passed. The fight for justice demanded courage, and he was willing to risk everything to make sure that fight was won. As the reforms continued to unfold, Julian began to see signs of change within the police departments that had been most resistant. In one precinct, a police captain who had once vocally opposed the reforms reached out to Julian, asking to meet privately. Julian agreed, and they met at a local diner, where the captain, an older white man, with a weathered face and a weary smile, sat across from him, looking conflicted. Congressman, I wanted to talk to you because, well, I think I owe you an apology, the captain said, stirring his coffee. When these reforms first passed, I was angry. I felt like you were targeting us, like you didn't understand what we go through out there. But I've been doing some thinking, and I've realized that maybe you're right. Maybe we need to change. Julian listened, feeling a mixture of surprise and respect. What made you change your mind? He asked. The captain looked down, sighing. It was the training, the new de-escalation techniques, the bias training. I see now that it's not just about making our jobs harder. It's about making our jobs better. And it's about making sure we're doing right by the people we're sworn to protect. Julian smiled, feeling a glimmer of hope. That's all I've ever wanted, he said, to make sure that every officer, every citizen is treated with respect and fairness. If you're willing to work with me, Captain, I think we can do a lot of good together. The captain nodded, extending his hand across the table. I am willing, he said, his voice sincere. Let's make this work. They shook hands, sealing a partnership that would go on to create one of the most successful community police programs in the state, a model that would later be adopted in other cities across the country. The partnership between Julian and the police captain marked a turning point, not just for the precinct, but for the entire city. His willingness to embrace 
Reforms spread quickly, and soon other police departments followed suit. Training sessions focused on bias awareness and de escalation. Standard practice and officers who had once been skeptical about the reforms began to see their benefits firsthand. The community, once distrustful of the police, started to view them in a new light. One evening, as Julian attended a community event in a park, he witnessed the change up close. Officers, who had once patrolled the area with an air of suspicion, were now sitting down with residents, chatting, playing basketball with the kids, and engaging with the community in a way that hadn't happened before. Julian felt an overwhelming sense of pride as he saw smiles on both sides, officers and community members building bonds that had long been broken. As he walked through the park, he was stopped by a mother who had once been a vocal critic of the police. She had tears in her eyes as she shook his hand. Congressman Thompson, I don't know how to thank you, she said. For the first time in years, I feel safe letting my kids play outside. I see the officers talking to people, building relationships. It feels different. It feels like we're part of the same community again. Julian smiled warmly, shaking her hand. That's exactly what we're trying to do, he said. It's about making sure that we're all looking out for each other. I'm just grateful to see it finally happening. The impact of the reforms rippled throughout the city, leading to a noticeable decrease in complaints against officers and an increase in community engagement. But Julian knew that this was only the beginning. The work had to continue to ensure that these changes weren't just temporary, but lasting. While the reforms were making a difference, Julian's fight for change came with personal sacrifices. The long hours, constant travel, and public scrutiny took a toll on his family. Sonia continued to be his rock, supporting him through every challenge. But there were moments when the weight of the journey felt heavy on their relationship. Julian often came home late, exhausted from a day of meetings and public appearances. And there were times when Sonia wished he could leave the work behind even if just for one night. One weekend, Julian's daughter, Layla, pulled him aside, her face serious. Dad, when are you going to take a break? She asked, her voice filled with concern. You're always working, always fighting for everyone else. But what about us? What about our family? Julian felt a pang of guilt. He knew that in his pursuit of justice, he had sometimes neglected the people who mattered most. I'm sorry, Layla, he said softly, pulling her into a hug. I know it's been hard, but everything I'm doing, it's for you, for our family, and for all the families out there who deserve to live in a fair and just world. I just need you to be patient with me a little longer. Layla hugged him tightly, her eyes filled with understanding. I get it, Dad. I just, I miss you sometimes, that's all. Julian promised to make more time for his family, but he knew that finding the balance between his public work and private life was one of the hardest challenges he faced. He made a vow to spend Sundays with his family, no work, no phone calls, just quality time. And though the fight for reform still occupied most of his days, those Sundays became a cherished time for them to reconnect and find peace in the midst of the storm. One of the pivotal moments in Julian's journey came when he was asked to give a keynote speech at a national conference on justice reform. The conference was attended by activists, policymakers, police officers, and community leaders from all over the country, all eager to hear his perspective on how to bridge the divides that had torn communities apart. It was a moment for Julian to share the lessons learned from his work and inspire others to join the movement for change. The auditorium was packed as Julian took the stage, the lights bright and the room buzzing with anticipation. He paused for a moment, taking in the sight of so many faces from different walks of life all united by a desire to see a better future. I stand before you today, not just as a congressman, but as a man who has lived the struggle we're here to talk about, he began, his voice strong and steady. Julian spoke of the reforms, the challenges and the victories, but he also spoke from the heart about what it meant to fight for a better world. He shared stories of the residents he had met, the police officers who had changed their ways, and the moments that had restored his faith in the power of community. We can't afford to see each other as enemies, he said. We have to see each other as neighbors, as partners, as people who all want the same thing, 
safety, fairness, and respect. The crowd was silent as he spoke, captivated by his words. And as he concluded his speech, he left them with a message of hope. Change is never easy and it's never quick, but it is possible. And it starts with each of us doing our part, listening to each other, and believing that we can build a better world. Let's make that world a reality, together. The applause was deafening, and as Julian left the stage, he was met with hugs, handshakes, and words of encouragement from people who had been inspired by his story. It was a moment of unity, a moment where the divisions felt small in the face of their shared vision for justice and equality. As Julian continued his work, he found hope in the next generation, the young people who were stepping up to continue the fight for justice and equality. He met with youth leaders, activists, and students who were eager to learn, eager to make their voices heard, and eager to build on the foundation he had laid. It filled him with pride to see how passionate they were, how unafraid they were to challenge the status quo. At a youth summit in his district, Julian was invited to speak with a group of high school students who had formed their own social justice club. They were smart, outspoken, and determined to make a difference in their own way. After his speech, a young black student named Malik approached him with wide eyes and a firm handshake. Congressman Thompson, you inspire me, Malik said earnestly. I want to be like you. I want to make change happen. Julian smiled, feeling a sense of hope for the future. You're already making change happen, he replied. And I know that you and all the young people here are going to go on to do great things. Just remember that it won't always be easy. There will be setbacks and challenges, but don't ever lose sight of what you're fighting for. And know that I'm here to support you every step of the way. The students clapped and cheered, and Julian felt a renewed sense of purpose. He knew that the work he was doing wasn't just for his generation, it was for the generations to come. And seeing the passion in the eyes of young people like Malik gave him the strength to keep pushing forward, knowing that the torch would one day be passed on to capable, caring hands. Years passed, and Julian's fight for justice continued. The reforms he had championed began to reshape communities, rebuilding trust and fostering dialogue between police and residents. Though there were still challenges and the path to equality was far from complete, the progress made was undeniable. Julian had become not just a politician, but a symbol of resilience, hope, and the power of speaking truth to power. As he looked back on his journey, from the moment he was pulled over by the police, to the day the reform bill was passed to the countless meetings, speeches, and struggles, Julian felt a deep sense of fulfillment. It hadn't been easy, and there had been moments when he questioned whether change was possible, but now, looking at the impact of his work, he knew that it had all been worth it. One day as Julian sat on his porch, watching the sun set over the city he loved, Sonia joined him, placing a gentle hand on his shoulder. You've done so much, she said softly, pride glowing in her eyes. And you're not done yet. Julian nodded, a smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. No, I'm not, he said, looking out at the skyline. But it's not just about me, it's about all of us working together to build a better world. And as long as we keep fighting, I know we'll get there. And with that, they sat together, hand in hand, watching the sun dip below the horizon, knowing that the fight for justice was a journey, one that would continue until every person, regardless of race or background, could live with dignity, respect, and hope for a brighter tomorrow.